off into the leaf litter. And she lays about 8,000 eggs. And then she really wants to borrow chocolate. And then she dies. So these eggs are hanging out in the leaf litter until the following spring, at which point the eggs hatch. And they have into the stage called larvae. Now, those of you who have thought that you had chiggers or are familiar with term chiggers, around Long Island, we have never been able to find any chiggers, even though we've used specialized um, traps and stuff. But actually, chiggers are not chiggers on Long Island. They're larval lone star ticks. So every little speck of dust on here is actually a tick. Now, I'm going to pass this around, let you guys look at it. If you start itching, this is good. It means I'm doing my job correctly. There you go. So anyway, after the larvae hatch, they're looking around for something to eat and something to do. The good thing about larvae, if anything can be said to be good about them, is that you are the first thing that they are feeding on, so they're not likely to transmit any diseases if you're a lone star larvae. Unfortunately, deer tick or black-legged tick larvae occasionally can transmit a disease called Brillia mimoltoi which is closely related to Lyme's disease, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later, but you really have to be kind of hanging out in the deep woods usually to encounter a larvae, and normally they don't want to snack on you. All right, so after the larvae have munched out on you, they are going to molt again into a different life stage, and this life stage is called the nymph. Now the nymph is going to feed on other things, including you, but the nymph can actually transmit disease because, of course, those larvae that may have fed on something like a mouse or another creature that is carrying disease may have picked it up. And so at this point, nymphs can give you some sort of disease. They don't always do so, but they can. And of course, the larva, I'm sorry, the nymph that really does most of the heavy lifting is the deer tick or black leg tick nymph. And we're going to look at those in just a few minutes. That's the one you really have to watch out for because they can sneak on and sneak off and we'll never know they've been there. So then after the nymph is all nice and full of blood, it will move again and become an adult. It will mate, it will go lay eggs, and then the whole life cycle starts again. So we have a lot of ticks and a lot of different life stages that can bother us. Let's see if we can make some sense out of this. So uh, the uh, female lone star tick can lay over 8,000 eggs in one day. If we're talking about a black leg or a deer tick, we're talking about 3,000 eggs before she dies. Anybody want to do the math? That's just one tick. So we know we have a huge population. We also have a huge population of deer <coughs> and rodents and other creatures. And because there's less and less land, we like to live in something that's pretty. It's in nature. More and more, we're crossing paths with both the ticks and the creatures that may be carrying the disease carrying the ticks around. So, there she is. She really wants to buy a chocolate. Those are tick eggs. Not that easy to find. I found them one time under the microscope and I thought that I was very lucky to do that one here. Okay, so these are the big three ticks that we have to deal with on Long Island. Let's start with the Lone Star ticks. Lone Star ticks, all life stages, like to feed on humans. Here's Mama Lone Star. She's known because of her glitter dot right in the middle of her back. Pretty easy to recognize. Whoops, here go my glasses. And then we have Papa Lone Star. He also has some bling right around the edge of his abdomen. I like to call the rim of the abdomen the pie crust. You'll see why in just a few minutes. Then we have the nymphs. The nymphs are perfectly round. They're the size and the shape of the head of a pin. And they tend to hang out wherever rodents are hiding. So if you have a bunch of junipers or brown cover, the rodents like to hide under there. Well, the nymph ticks do as well. And then finally, we have what people have been referring to as chiggers. But we now know that they're actually larval lone star ticks. And unfortunately, they tend to be mislabeled on the internet. Have you ever noticed that almost every article about ticks or tick-borne disease has the wrong tick match with them? So like they'll have an article about uh, Lyme disease and they'll have a long star tick. They don't carry it. So that's another thing to be aware of. Now the next tick that we want to take a look at it and look at, and we'll take a look at some more pictures later on, is the black-legged or deer tick. This is the only tick that carries Lyme disease. Other ticks carry other things. This is the only one that carries Lyme disease. It's the only one that carries babesiosis. 
It's the only one that carries anaphylaxis, and it is the only one that carries Pilasin or deer tick virus, which has been in the news quite a bit lately. So here we go. Here is mama deer tick, and we are going to look more closely at both the rim of her abdomen and her mouth parts, because that's going to help you recognize her. This is papa deer tick. Now, because we had a very mild winter that was above 40 degrees pretty much most of the winter, these guys were active all winter long. So you can't say, okay, it's winter, I don't have to worry. If the temperature is warm enough, you always have to worry. And then finally, here's the nymph. But the nymph here has just hatched out. And so he or she hasn't hardened off completely. And that's why the color is lighter. That's why I don't like to identify ticks according to color. And if you guys have questions during this, just shout them out and I'll try to answer them right within the context of the lecture. And then finally, we have the dog tick. Most of you guys are familiar with the dog ticks. You know, these are the largest tick we have. The female dog tick has got a nice white shield on her back. The male dog tick has got this groovy sort of art deco pattern on his back. And you know, you like to flip these guys out into the third lane of traffic and take bets on when the 16 or 18 wheeler is going to roll over them. But don't do that. They actually can transmit something called Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, which is pretty important. We have actually had epidemics of Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever right here on Long Island, late 70s and early 80s. It's also called black measles. So if you wake up and you're feeling really, really icky and you've been bitten by one of these and you look down at your feet and there are speckles all over your feet, Go immediately to the emergency room. Don't wait for you know, a month and a half appointment away with your doctor. Go to the emergency room because this can make you very sick very quickly. And it has a relatively high mortality rate associated with it. And we'll talk more about that later on. So are you ready for the biggest relationships in your life? Here we go. Not what you're expecting. Here is that. <laughs> anyway. Um, Deer uh, are associated with lone star ticks. What they do is they will actually uh, carry them around with them. And rodents are associated with black-legged ticks. Black-legged ticks, when they hatch out, they don't go very far from the location that they hatched out, maybe six to eight feet total. So they're associated with things like white-footed mice, and which carry a lot of diseases. It's reservoir in them, but also chipmunks. Disney's favorite rodent and they are associated with ticks and tick diseases. Who knew? Okay, the other big factor I just told you about, I don't have to say it again, but now let's think about this. Why is that doing that? Very weird, must be something electrical. Anyway, <clears throat> bird feeders. You know, birds are messy eaters. They're picking through the seed, they're throwing it on the ground, and of course, whatever lands on the ground, rodents are attracted to, and of course, ticks are attracted to the rodents. Deer also like to eat from bird feeders and bird bats. It's been awfully dry lately, so deer and rodents are looking for a source of moisture. So usually when we have bird feeders and things like that, we also like to have a little tableau where we might have a pile of rocks or a pretty stump or something or a log hanging around there. You created a perfect habitat for the rodent tick and deer scenario. So think about that when you go home and you look at your yard. You don't have to get rid of your stuff, you just have to think how you can make it better so that you don't end up with that situation. Okay, oops, All right, so where do we begin? Down, down, they're on your ankles now, and they're moving up. They all walk up. They don't fall out of trees, and they don't jump, they don't fly, but what they do do is they boogie on up your body so quickly that you may think that they've arrived from some other source. Why do they do that? Let's think about it. If you're a grazing mammal like a deer, where's the one place you can't scratch? Your head or your ears. So that's why ticks move up so quickly. So that means that when you're getting ready to go out and about, one thing you do want to think about treating is actually your hat. And so that the ticks don't get up there and find that they have a free reign. So we begin with proper identification. Even professionals will mistakenly identify ticks. Physicians will tell you you have chiggers. That's because they don't have the experience. Now you can always bring a tick into Extension and have us identify it, or you can email me and I can identify it for you. And if I can't do it, 
Um, <clears throat> over the computer, I can always come and pick up samples. I'm happy to do that. We're here to help you out. But anyway, the first thing to establish is, is it really a tick? There are some tiny little things that are crawling around and they look at it and say, is it or isn't it? Well, if you've got a magnifying glass, you can go to the $1.25 store. Boy, am I burned about them <laughs> up in the price of a dollar. It's like, hee, 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 hee. Anyway, the first thing to ask you, does it have antenna? If it has antenna, it's not a tick. Ticks are related to spiders. Does it have wings? Nope, not a tick. Ticks don't have wings, they're not insects. Does it have only six legs? Chances are it's an insect. Now, if we look at the larvae of ticks, they actually ticks they actually only have six legs. They get their extra pair of legs when they molt. But we're not even going to think about those because those larvae are really tiny and they're not probably going to count for legs anyway. And then the final thing to look at is three body parts, not two. Remember, a spider has only two body parts. It has a fused head and a fused thorax <clears throat> together, and then it has a big abdomen. Sometimes I look at myself in the mirror and say, are you a spider? Anyway, but with the insects, they actually have three distinct body parts, which we can see here. We've got a head, a thorax, and an abdomen. And if we spread these shiny things apart here, this is a beetle, we'll see a pair of wings. So that's an insect. How about that? It has an insect or a tick? Tick, that's right. Okay. So we passed the tick test. Hey, that's great. I know what I mean. Okay. Now you can decide what kind of tick you have. And this can be very important. And I like to start with knowing whether or not I have a deer or a black legged tick. So one of the things we're going to do, and it's relatively easy, is we're going to look at the pie crust of the tick. Now this is a dog tick. How many bakers do we have in the audience? You guys like to make pies? I like to make pies. Like it's fun. Pies. No, I like to make pies very much. That's why I like to make them. But anyway, if you look at pie dishes, you'll notice some pie dishes have a smooth rim, and some pie dishes have a fluted rim. This is true for ticks, too. If you have a fluted rim, see the little divisions in the rim? You don't have a deer or black-legged tick. You don't have a deer or black-legged tick that can give you Lyme disease. Black-legged ticks, or deer ticks, have a smooth pie crust. So if you look along the rim here, you see there aren't any breaks in it. It's completely smooth. This is pretty easy to see with a magnifier. And that's one thing you absolutely should have, is a little magnifier. They're really cheap, and you can carry that with you wherever you go. So if we look here, we see on this side, this is smooth. But this one has little breaks in it. So that's your deer tick, and that is not a deer tick. And that's the first thing that we're going to do. So we're going to look at that. There's the fluted pie crust. Now, which rim is which? Is this a deer tick? No. No. Why? Wow. Is that little race? Is that a deer tick? Yes. It has a smooth rim. So that's one thing that we can look at. Now, why do I have this weird collection of tools? Because each of the three major kinds of ticks that we're dealing with have very distinct mouth parts. Again, you can see this with a magnifier. So this. It's a pair of blunt nose pliers, and <coughs> excuse me, if we look at a dog tick, blunt nose pliers. The next one over is a pair of needle nose pliers. If we look at the deer tick, needle nose pliers. And we can see that very easily. And then finally, this thing is a set of old-fashioned candle molds. But if we look at the long star tick, what do we see? A pair of old-fashioned candle molds. So again, get out your magnifier and this mouth part, that's going to help you to identify the tick. And I, like I said, that's pretty important in terms of knowing what that tick can potentially do to you or for you. So suppose you did have a deer tick. Well, there's Papa, smooth rim, he's all dark. And there's Mama, she's got a kind of a mahogany colored body. These are sort of teardrop shaped. This is the smallest tick we're dealing with when we're out there looking at it. And there are those needle nose part of Fire-shaped mouth parts. And look at that. Just in time for Memorial Day, we've got a family picnic going on. They're going to pose for the family photo. We have got Papa Tick, Mama Tick, and then Nim Tick. Look at those pointy mouth parts. We don't have to worry about the larvae for the most part. Now, we know that the larvae can transmit something called Borrelia mitoi, but that's not very common, and it's uncommon to encounter the larvae. You just have to be aware that you could become ill from them. But all, almost all of the really heavy lifting 
for disease transmission for almost all the ticks occurs from this little guy right here or gal because they're so tiny and their saliva is not as itchy as lone star ticks. Lone star ticks have super itchy saliva. They trigger your immune system. These will itch, but not as much, so they can kind of come on to you and drop off of you without you ever knowing it. And these guys, or any tick, needs to feed for 24 hours or more to effectively transmit whatever it might be carrying. Now, it may not transmit it, but that's the time frame, except for one disease. And that disease is Wasson or deer tick virus, which we're hearing more and more about. It can transmit that in 15 minutes. So you always want to be very aware of what might be on you. So there's the adult male deer tick. Chance of encountering him is moderate. Most of the, the biggest kind of deer tick encounter him is February to June. But I'm starting to see them more and more in the autumn because we're having prolonged warm autumns. But anyway, the next one is mama tick, uh, deer tick. Again, the same sort of time frame that I didn't see them in the autumn. And then here are the uh, nymphs. And just about the time you put on your short shorts to go out and play in the yard, that's when these guys are going to be around. Again, you will see them in the autumn too, but be aware, anytime you see chipmunks or downed logs, that's where the nymphs really love to hang out because you've got a lot of moisture. Deer ticks are more moisture um, requiring than all the other ticks. Dog ticks somewhat so. Lone star ticks, they like it dry, not like it dry, but they tolerate more dry conditions. And they're the ones that are more likely to be out and about following you around. We'll talk about that in a minute. So what was the deer tick? Well, you're back to your magnifier. And here are the other two types of ticks that you could possibly have. Now, if you look at this, we see it has blunt mouth parts, so that makes it a dog tick. It also looks like an evil emperor from a video game. You see the hat and the <clears throat> and also it's doing the magnet. Right. So that's your dog tick. And then there's your lone star tick. And those mouth parts are like the old-fashioned candle moves. So let's explore this and see what we might have. So there we go. There's the tools. Okay. So in the dog tick, the only life stages that are likely to feed on you are the adults. The nymphs, and the larvae really only want rodents, so they dine in different restaurants. But if you look at the lone star tick, all stages of the lone star tick are likely to make a meal on you. This is mama, and a taco with a little bling, and then there is the nymph. Now the nymphs are actually rounder than that. Remember I said the size and shape of head and pin, and then there are the larval lone star ticks. So like the whole chickens. Okay. So if you chose the dog tick, you see mama and papa, you don't have to worry about the nymphs and the larvae. And there's a male, there's a female. What can you expect? Well, most of the time, the adult male dog tick is going to be around February to September. After September, their populations really do calm down. You'll be seeing these out and about now or in the rest of the summer. And then there's a female, same thing, female dog tick. And then you have the long star tick. We know that all of the life stages can make a meal on it. Now here, again, it's a nymph, not as much more round, and that's what you're likely to see. It looks like little pin dots. And then there are the larvae in relationship to a pen. Now there's something that the nymphs and the larvae do, which is very annoying, and they congregate in a great big bunch. <clears throat> the nymphs, they're the ones that are hanging out where the rodents are hanging out. And simply by giving your ground cover, like the variety of your hair cut with a mower, you can cause the rodents to disperse and the nymphs will disperse. When the larvae of the lone star ticks hatch out initially from the egg mass, they hang together in a clump. So when you brush up against the clump, they all can get on you at the same time, and then they start walking upwards. But they're tired, so they get tired, and that's why you end up with a lot of them centered around your feet and the lower part of the leg. It's just too tired to climb any higher. So what can you expect from lone star ticks? Well, here's the adult male lone star tick. Why do you encountering any life stage of lone star tick is very high. It's the most common tick on Long Island. March to September, but you'll see the adults after that. Okay, there's the female, same thing, very high likelihood of encountering. March to September or later, there's the nymph, March to November. So these guys just hang around, hang around, hang around. And then here are the larvae. 
likelihood of them coming is very high now, late May to October or even later. In a warm year, and this is not been a warm year, we'll see the larvae out a couple weeks before this because they respond to that warmth. In fact, when we first start, started finding them in May, people who should have known better, our colleagues, are like, nah, like, yeah, like, ooh. So you have to be aware of getting the beginning of May that they might be out there. Now, disease potential for the larvae, like we said, there's one good thing to be said about the larvae, is that you are the first thing that they have fed on, so they're not likely to transmit anything to you. And these are what people think of too. Okay. So now if you watch Family Guy, you're familiar with the concept of the cankle. That's my cankle. I was out doing uh, carpentry work in Montauk. I brushed up against some grass. It was in the month of May. And then as I went to get in the car, I looked down and went, oh, no. You just say, I love my socks in Montauk. They're very happy. They send me a postcard every summer. They're having a great time. But I almost brought home 10,000 new friends. Everywhere there's a red arrow, there's a little dot under the arrow. That is a larval one star tick. Now, why do you, what is going on with this? Okay, I think it's a power I don't know. Anyway, the reason that people think that the larval lone stars are cheaters is because you get a very similar looking bite. You get this tiny little blister that's filled with fluid. It itches like crazy. You want to scratch your legs off. But don't do it because you've got bacteria underneath your fingernails. Instead, use an oatmeal type uh, based emollient or baking soda or soak in a hot tub or soak in salt water. Do something other than scratching. The chigger feeds very differently than the tick. The chigger actually eats fluid that's inside your cells. And so a chigger, which is a type of mite, will spit out a thing of enzyme. It will digest a hole in your skin. And in doing so, it disrupts proteins, and those proteins will re and it's got a nice little juice box straw. It is not part where you can get the fluid that's in your cells, not the blood. Your body doesn't recognize the proteins that have been disturbed by this whole process, and so it starts to make you itch. With a tick, the tick saliva disturbs the immune system, and the tick is drilling for blood, a little tiny blood vessel, so that they can get some blood. So, a true chigger looks like this, and this is the larval lone star tick, and of course this is labeled a chigger on the internet. So if everything, there's another one, and then here is a fully fed individual, so happy. And then you can see that this is a chigger getting some fluid from your cells, and then there's an actual tick that's poked into the blood vessel. Now this is called a hypostome, that's part of the mouth part. And they've got backwards facing bars. So that's why it's so really difficult to pull a tick out. And there's a protocol that we'll go over about pulling ticks out. So again, you don't find the shooters on Long Island. But another thing we want to remember is that when you're getting ready to go outside, don't be like me and buy your socks at the dollar store, 25 store. Because if you take cheap socks and you pull them and then you look up into the light, you'll see all these gaps that tiny little ticks can dart right through. Same thing is true for your boots. You want solid boots, things without grommets, if you can. Going out in sandals and shorts is asking for it. And you're like, yeah, but it's summer. Now what about these guys, these little red things? You go sit on a bench in June, you look down, you're like, oh no! Well, they want to be bad. They're one of these. But if you take your finger and you squish them, they're done. This is a type of clover mite. Also, you don't want to do this in your $300 silk shirt because it can stain, but you don't have to worry about that. Okay, so let's see what we can find out here. The um, uh, lone stars are easily scratched off, but the itch is going to persist for about three weeks. And again, their, their pictures are mislabeled. But here's something else to think about. When you're going out in your car to take a hike, carry extra shoes and socks. Because when you come back from that hike, if you climb right into your vehicle, you're climbing in with whatever's climbed on you. And then they're going to be in your car for a while. You know, they're going to be hanging out on the dashboard, changing your music, messing up your GPS, fighting in the back seat. If you simply take off your socks and shoes before you get into the car and change them out, when you get home, you can throw them and your clothing in here into the dryer. High heat, 
20 to 40 minutes, and that will desiccate the ticks and kill them. If you put them in the washing machine, they can actually survive that. They will get on the brim, look at it, like, ah, 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 ah. Uh, dry heat is the same that will get rid of them. And you're like, I'm not going to throw my $150 shoes in the dryer. Are you crazy? Okay. If you can't do that, put them in a clear plastic bag, tie it off really tightly, and put them in the car to either heat up to the point where they die, or you can put them outside. And if you listen very carefully, you can hear them screaming, which is very satisfying. Okay. Um, let's see here. So, there may be more that Lone Star Larry can do. How many of you have heard of a disease called alpha-gal, or alpha-gal syndrome? Alpha-gal syndrome is an allergy, it's not a disease. It's an allergy to mammalian meat, not the chicken or fish, but mammalian meat. How does this work? Okay, so you were bitten by a lot of lone star ticks. And then you go to the barbecue this weekend, you have a nice big juicy hamburger, and about four or five weeks, or not four or five weeks, four or five hours later, you wake up and you're like, oh, something's not right. You stagger into the bathroom, you look in the mirror, and you're covered with hives. You might be wheezing a little bit, and you're itching like crazy. What's going on? Well, there is a compound in the saliva of Lone Star Ticks that is so similar to a compound in mammalian meat or in gelatin or even dairy products sometimes that your body can't tell the difference. So when it responds to the saliva of Lone Star Ticks, it will also respond to mammalian meats. And this is called alpha-gal syndrome because the compound is alpha-galactose. So what does this mean long term? Well, some people can get rid of the reaction by simply avoiding uh, mammalian meats and not getting bitten by ticks for a prolonged period of time, and then they recover. Other people are stuck with this for good. So it's good to know there's a handout about this up front here, and it's something to be aware of, that it is not a disease. It's an allergic reaction. And when you get tested, if you think you have it, you want to be tested specifically for alpha-gal, not just a generalized meat allergy. Okay. Okay, now, a couple of new ticks on the block, just to have a little more joy be added to this whole presentation. Do you guys remember Marlo Thomas in That Girl? Remember her hairdo, the flip? So popular. This tick has a flip. See the little thing sticking off the side of its head? This is the Asian longhorn tick, and you may have heard quite a bit about this. They don't like to bite humans. They much prefer livestock, but if they're really desperate, they will stop in into human uh, fast food and they'll have some. They're also all ladies. They reproduce like aphids, so they don't need nails. And they have another unusual thing in that they will appear on the ends of uh, plants about 18 inches high uh, in all different life stages, all stacked up together. Now, a normal tick quests solely on the end of a piece of vegetation, probably about 18 inches high. It's like a sports thing, they're like, whoa, and then they've got these little cookie type things on the ends of their legs, which help them to hang on to skin and on to hair. In terms of the Lone Star Tick, the Lone Star Tick will do that, but it will also follow you around, keying in on your chemistry. So if you feel like you're being followed, if your eyes on you, you probably do. It's probably a lone star with a knife and a fork just waiting for you. Doesn't that make you feel good? Okay, another tip we may be seeing more of, and it looks like a cross between a lone star and a dog tip. This is the Gulf Coast tick. They're in Staten Island, they're sporadically on Long Island, but they have a pattern that's a little bit different than the dog tick. There's a kind of a shield on this one. It looks like a mouth part. It looks like a spritz bottle. So if you see this, let us know. If you see the Asian longhorn beetle, or beetle, uh, Asian longhorn tick, let us know. So we're trying to track these as they come through on that. Okay, so let's talk about safe tick, I'm sorry, tick removal. If I have a tick, pretend one of the various and sundry freckles on my arm is a tick. It's oriented this way, and it's bitten me, but I want to get rid of it. So we come in perpendicular, with the tweezers, one arm underneath the tick, 
one arm over the top of the tick as close to the head as you can possibly get. And you pinch down and then you rotate about 45 degrees this way. And then like this, using your fingers to brace, you pull slowly and steadily backwards until the tick lets go. Now sometimes, no matter how careful you are, you're going to break off the tick's head. The first thing you want to do is run around the room screaming at the top of your lungs. I got a tick in me! I got a tick in me! <laughs> Once you're finished with the tick head hissing, then what you want to do is you want to disinfect the area, which you want to do anyway, even if you get the tick out successfully. But do it with something that's going to dry things up, either alcohol or perhaps peroxide. And what that will do is it will allow the tick head to dry up and then it will fall out in a few days. The worst thing you can do is actually pick at it because, again, we have um, bacteria under our fingernails. These are not sterile. There's all kinds of crud on the ends of these, and you don't want to get sick. If you cannot resist picking at it, go to a medical professional and let them remove the head, or just watch it, and if it looks weird, if it feels weird, head in or head out, then you go to see a medical professional. What are some other things that you do not want to do with this tick that is bitten? You don't want to try to burn it out. I know you're all pyros, and you really want to set that tick on fire, whether it's in your body or in the ashtray. <laughs> but when you do that, you cause a tick to explode, and whatever's inside the tick is going to go flying around on your eyelid, on your lip, in your coffee cup. Don't do it. Also, it can get into little cuts and cracks on your hand where you work outside, and then you can actually get sick from that. Don't coat the tick with either Vaseline or nail polish, even if it's a pretty color of nail polish, because what that will do is that will make the tick kind of heave ho into the conduit it has into your skin, and that can make you sick as well. Don't take the tick and try to crush, crush it between your fingernails, same thing, and really the best thing you don't want to do is to put the tick down the toilet. Because remember, they can survive water. So after you think you've flushed this thing away, you're going to stagger into the bathroom at about 3 o'clock in the morning and go, I can pee, I can pee. And that tick's going to be sitting on the rim of the toilet. Like, Come to me, honey. So don't do that. Um, what do you do with a tick that is out? If the tick has not bitten you, you can wrap it up in tape. But you want two loops of tape, one going this way and one going that way. If you have a single loop of tape, that tick can go this way. And wiggle out in a single loop, and half an hour later you're going to go back and go, oh no! But if you do this and then that across purposes, that will keep the tick contained. If the tick did bite you, what you want to do is to put it into a Ziploc bag, write the date in an indelible marker on the bag, throw out the Ben and Jerry's from 1983, throw out the meatloaf from 1984 keep it in your freezer until you know that you're not going to develop symptoms. Not that they really send the ticks out for testing anymore, but it helps the physician if you know what kind of tick it is to eliminate possibly what diseases you may have. So I like to hang on to them. Okay, there are those backwards facing mouth parts, and that's just what I said before. Okay, now these are tick keys. You can get these almost anywhere. These are fine to use. I like the tweezers better. It's hard to get the end of that over a teeny tiny tick, whereas the tweezers will take care of that, but you can certainly use those. Okay, I already said that. Talk about tick destruction. Okay. Now, see what I mean? Okay. Now, meet your two new best friends. Masking tape and fancy masking tape. Whenever you go for a walk, you should have these with you. This makes a handy dandy fashion statement right over your wrist like that, a little bracelet. But anyway, why you want this is you want to wrap a piece of this backwards over your fist and you want to do this. And you can, if you run through a whole bunch of ticks, you can actually wipe this off or pat yourself down. The ticks will stick to the tape going, me. and that's very satisfying too. But you can't possibly pick off all the larval lone star ticks if you happen to wander through them, whereas the tape will help to clean them up, and you can get that very quickly, whereas picking them off <coughs> individually takes more time, you'll miss some. Okay, so what other things can you do as a precaution? You want to wear solid boots without the grommets if you can. There are things you can get called tick gaiters where they fit 
over your foot gear and then up to your knee. You can wrap tape <coughs> backwards around your legs to catch any ticks that might be walking up. One of my friends in vector control has a really good solution or an additional thing that you can do to help to keep the ticks off of you. He was inspired by John McEnroe, who was the temper tantrum throwing tennis player of the 1970s and 1980s. You can get terry cloth wristbands very inexpensively. You can treat them with a pesticide called permethrin and allow them to dry. This is a pesticide. It should never go on your skin when it's wet. When you put it on your gear and clothing and let the gear and clothing dry, that's fine. But anyway, you can treat your terry cloth bands for your wrists and your ankles, and that will help to keep the ticks off of you. Stay toward the center of the path that you're walking on, and then, again, none of these cheap socks. You want tightly woven socks or athletic gear. In fact, in the Far East, where they have a mite-borne disease called Tsukamushi disease, which is a lot of fun to say, especially if you spit on the person next to you, they will have people wear pantyhose to prevent, uh, both male and female, to prevent the mites from getting into the skin. You can do that if you want. But you want to check yourself, your gear, and your pets frequently for ticks. Don't fall into the trap of thinking because you either put on repellent or you spray that you're safe. You have to be vigilant all the time. Carry a nice fine glass mask and tape and tweezers. They're lightweight and it gives you a measure of insurance. And here is one of my friends checking over her dog. Um, ticks love cracks and crevices and warm spots to crawl into. And this is true for human beings, too. You know, Thomas is English month and lots of cracks and crevices. This is an expanding lighted mechanics mirror. It has a telescoping thing on it. If you don't have someone to check your back or you don't trust that person to do a good job, almost everybody has got a mirror on their closet door. You can get this expanding uh, mechanics mirror and look at your back and whatever is there will be reflected in the mirror. Of course, this sets me back for several weeks because I'm so horrified at all what I see, but it keeps me from having ticks uh, on the back of me and getting them in my lens. Anyway, okay, so the class, we already talked about this, a little hooky type thing to allow them to hang on. And now, let's talk about repellents, which is one of the most important parts of the talk. There's somebody that goes around on the island who should know better talking about lavender dryer sheets, how you'll be fully protected if only you have one in each pocket. You'll smell great. You won't be protected at all. So how do you protect yourself? Well, that's what we're going to tell you about. <clears throat> what kinds of things affect how well repellents, not pesticides, work? Well, it could be the frequency and concentration and uniformity of application. It could be the activity level of host, but these factors are super important with how well your repellents work. Rubbing from clothing, if you're walking around or working outside, evaporation or absorption from the skin surface, washing off from sweat or rain. I could sweat in an igloo, so I have to reapply my repellent very frequently. Wind, and here is the one that's the real kicker. Higher temperatures, each increase of 18 degrees, which is not hard to imagine if you start the day at 50, today, and it gets up to 68, today, can lead to as much as a 50% reduction in your protection time. Uh -oh. Also, if you're applying sunblock, sunblock first, then your repellent. That's very important to know, too. Okay, so there are some generalized precautions Never reply, apply your pellet on cuts or wounds that you're going to put it on your face, put it on your hands first, and pat it on. But the thing is that you have to remember, ultimately, that you do not go by brand names when you select the repellent. You go by active ingredient. And this is where you're going to need your three pairs of dollar store, dollar 25 store glasses, because this, you don't do. This is a brand name. This tiny little print down here is the active ingredient. Most people are using active ingredients that are based on DEET. DEET is the gold standard for mosquitoes. It doesn't work quite as well for ticks. You're better off with two compounds for ticks. One is called picaridin, and the other one is called IR3535. I'm going to pass this around in just a minute. But 
even within those groups, there will be different formulations and there will be different lengths of time that those products are going to last. So how do you make a great choice for a repellent? You go online and you type in, rate my repellent. And the first thing that comes up is find a repellent that's right for you from the EPA. It's a database of all the repellents that are sold in this country with the amount, how long they last for mosquitoes and for ticks if the research has been done, and a lot of other great information. I'm going to pass this around, but I suggest that you download the database, select the six pages, and you can actually go through and make a selection before you buy your repellent, or you can check the repellent that you're currently using, and there's also an EPA registration number on there to find out what you have and if it's going to work um, the way that you want it to work. So that's very important. Down at the bottom of the can is what you're looking for. Now, for example, here, we've got two products. This is probably the deep wood pop. This is Ben's. And we look at the active ingredients. Both of these are deep. You might look at this one. This looks like it should be wonderful skin sensations. It looks like it's lovely. And it's going to do everything you want it to do. But active ingredient is deep. There's nothing wrong with deep and mosquitoes. And also the IR3535 and the card I'm recommending also works on mosquitoes. It's how well it works on ticks that can be somewhat misleading. This is oil of lemon eucalyptus. This one also works. It doesn't have quite as long an activity against things as the card or the IR3535. This one is a pesticide. This one, the active ingredient, the secret is in that tiny print at the bottom of the can. So that should help you out quite a bit, I think. All right, so now what are we going to look at next? I'm going to skip through this. Here we go. Now, okay, blah, 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 blah. All right, when you are treating your beer and clothing with the permethrin, which is a pesticide, be careful to do it outside, lots of good ventilation, allow it to dry thoroughly, before you use your beer and clothing. Also, while you're treating, keep your cats indoors. Cats are curious. Some of them can have a reaction to wet permethrin once it's dry. It's not gonna do anything for them, so that's something to think about. You can buy pre-treated gear and clothing um, from various locations, and they're usually good for 70 washings, like the socks, the shirts, the pants, what have you. And that's also an option for you. Okay. Citronella does not work really very well, and usually you get an hour of protection from citronella. So that's not going to be the be all and the end all for you. So here's my other colleague, also named Marie, and she's all dolled up for an experience in the field. She's got solid boots, light colored clothing, she has a little brace of the mask and she has a pearl neck on, a nice hat, and she has one of these things. This is a tick flag. I have one right here. And this is a really easy way of checking your property to see where your ticks may be located. Because sometimes they're in little pockets that you wouldn't expect. So you can get a plain old final pillowcase and a broom handle, and you are good to go. You can staple it on, or most pillowcases will have a pocket um, along the rim. You just open up the pocket. And what you want to do, you want to make sure the neighbors are watching because you want to give the neighbors a show. You drag this along very slowly for about 10 paces. And then you turn it over. And then you stare at it. By now, the neighbors have called the other neighbors and they're all going to the window to see what the heck they're doing. And so you kind of do one of these things. And then you get hypnotized by your keys. And then all of a sudden, the stuff on the flag starts to move. They're like, oh no. And that usually is going to be where you start to see the ticks. And you sometimes you have to actually stare at it for a while until you see the specks that are moving. Now the larger ticks will be very obvious. If you've got 10 ticks or so in a drag, that's usually a pretty heavy hot spot. And you might want to think to yourself, well, why is that a hot spot? When you do this kind of scouting for ticks, it's not going to tell you how many ticks you have, it's just going to tell you 
where they are, potentially, and also it's going to tell you um, the kind they are, because we're just talking about how to identify that. You can ask yourself these questions before you start the scouting process. Um, is the area considered a high risk area because it's frequented by people or trucks? Is the area near where deer may be bedding or traveling or grazing? You can tell that by the deer pool. And are there small mammals, mice, brown hogs, raccoons, or chipmunks seen in the area? That's a good place to start. And that just gives you a general idea. And that's how to make the flag. And again, five to 10 ticks on that drag tells you that you probably have a hot spot. Now, how can you reduce ticks in your property? The most effective way of protecting yourself is using a repellent and using that repellent correctly. Because when somebody comes in and sprays your property, number one, it gives you a false sense of security because the ticks can avoid the sprays. They can dive into the leaf litter and then come back. Even the safe well, quote, 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 safer stuff like the garlic sprays, all that, they don't last very long. And then the ticks are back, or the creatures that are trafficking through can bring them back. So again, treating yourself is really a better option than using pesticides on the lawn. Another thing that you probably want to do is you want to get rid of this plant here. This is a Japanese barberry, and most landscapes on Long Island <coughs> have them because deer will not eat them, but they like to sleep next to them because it provides good cover. Also, the umbrella-shaped nature of these plants means that the ticks can quest 24-7. In a normal questing situation, the ticks have to rehydrate periodically. So they're at about 18 inches high on the vegetation, and they're going along like this, and they're like, ah, oh, wait a minute, 10 o'clock, time for a coffee break. They'll climb back down to the leaf litter, drink their Starbucks, read their racing forms or their Wall Street Journal, and then they climb back up. Underneath the Japanese barberry, they don't have to do that. Plus, mice like to hang out with the Japanese barberry because it's good cover, and they like the fruit. Plus, you've got the deer that are sleeping on the edges of it sometimes, and this is an invasive plant. It can produce fruit and more plants at 4% light. So if you see it, try to get rid of that. Now, let me go back here for a minute. I wanted to mention so where are the ticks around the property? Well, 67% of the nymphs are in the woods right adjacent to residential property. 22% are in unmaintained woods, the lawn edge, the ecotone. The ecotone is where one kind of landscape turns into another. So right along the edge of the lawn where it turns into woods, that's where the ticks are likely to be. The moral of the story is you can install a barrier about three feet wide of large wood chips in the area. You can move the kids' play equipment out into the lawn. That's going to give them some protection. But there are actually two zones here. There's a zone that's around the edge of the property here, and then there's a zone up around the front of your house. If you're going to use products that are based on botanical oils and things like that, which are only going to give you 20 to 30 percent uh, relief, this is the area to use. And then this is where kids and the animals are more likely to be. And I know that you know this, these are individual houses, so the structure here is going to be a little bit different, but it is something to think about. OK, let's see. Japanese library, I talked about that. Garlic spray only lasts two to three days. Fencing, deer fencing is actually pretty effective. But really, the best strategy is a combination of techniques, rather than just a landscape spray or landscape modification to keep the animals walking through your yard, or just fencing, or just, etc. Now, the final part of the talk is going to be the parable of tick-borne disease. And this is where we're going to look at the different ticks and see what kinds of things that they're likely to give us. So here's a dog tick, Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. We already talked about that. Tularemia, which is a nasty bacterial disease usually associated with rabbit's feet or hunters, occasionally. But usually it's just Rocky Mountain spotted fever. We're worried about the dog tick. And then here, our, no, you can't see them. That was supposed to be those little speckles on your feet. Okay, deer or black legged ticks can carry Lyme disease, Powassan virus, or deer tick virus. Remember, this is the one that can be transmitted in 15 minutes. Anaplasmosis, babesiosis, 
and really I'm going to go to I come to Lark. The deer tick is really the one, like I said, that does a lot of heavy lifting of diseases, particularly the nymphs. So we want to stay away from the nymphs. Um, the DV is a protozoa, so that's going to need both your doxycycline, which is a standard treatment for most of the diseases, plus something else. There's actually a great CDC bulletin, I think it's from either 2016 or 2018, that goes into the different diseases and talks about what they're treated with. I really recommend that. If you want, I can email a link to that, and you can have a look at that. If you can't sleep at night, and you really won't be able to sleep. Remember that viruses do not respond to antibiotics. Okay, lone star tick. What are they known to have? Ehrlichiosis. That's the main one for lone star ticks. By the way, turkeys, which have a very large territory, can move ticks around. They'll eat ticks, but they also can move the lone star ticks around. Tularemia, which is rare. Alcohol is not a disease, it's an allergy. But again, your lone star ticks can cause that. And then there's just a somatic for the different diseases and which stages cause it. That's the lone star here to nymph. So if you're talking about where the diseases are being maintained, Borrelia is maintained in mice, Ehrlichia is maintained in disease in deer. And the percentage of ticks carrying certain diseases does not mean that they will necessarily transmit them. Okay, now speak for yourself. Okay, now let's talk about rashes. Everybody associates a rash with Lyme disease. Not so. Many times you can have Lyme disease with no rash whatsoever. The other diseases can produce a rash. So the rash is not the be all and the end all. But I did want to show you a weird rash, and um, we'll go back in just a minute and look at that other stuff, which is associated with a disease they did not talk about. This is also carried by the deer tick or black leg tick. This is called Bartonella. And this is often a cold infection with Lyme disease. And it has a rash that looks like stretch marks. That is very distinctive. None of the other ones do. Also, this is associated besides with general malaise, which all the diseases have, with pain in the bottom of the feet. So if you have something like that, ask your doctor to you take a look at Bartonella. So what I wanted to talk about was the testing protocol for um, uh, the typical tick pattern. If you have a typical tick pattern done by your doctor, it tests for Ehrlichia, Anaplasma, Babesia, and then two different uh, Lyme disease tests. The second one is only administered if the first one is in a gray area and you're not quite sure or you're displaying symptoms and you came up negative with the first Lyme test. What a tick pattern does not test for, and around here you probably should be tested for it, is Rocky Mountain Spot Fever, really Lymotoid, Bartonella, Pulassin or Deer Tick Fever, and of course Alcogal is a totally separate test. So there are some good uh, information uh, fact sheets also from the Mayo Clinic or Mayo Clinic. I don't know how to pronounce that. This is good. It's a tick testing algorithm. And when your numbers are down to 6 to 12 for square mile, tick form disease is actually rare in humans. We just have too many deer in the area that are in contact, potential contact with too many humans. And of course, we have lots of other creatures too. And this is where I'm going to stop and see if you guys, how many of you are itching? Is there anybody who's not itching? I have not done my job correctly. Okay, let me answer any questions that you might have. You really want me to leave. I've ruined your weekend. Right? Do you guys have any questions? Here you see. No? Okay. Yeah. I read somewhere that. What happens is that they have to be feeding actively. They secrete something that helps them to cement themselves to your skin. And then they have to be actively feeding for 24 hours or more. 
in order to transmit that. And they actually pump the disease up through their, their saliva, salivary glands, et cetera, and transmit it that way. And this is similar for all the diseases. And maybe I'm oversimplifying that because it's a really super interesting process. But yes, it does take a while. And if you get that tick off of you before 24 hours of feeding, generally you're not going to get anything from it so unless we're talking about the beer tick virus. Yeah, Yes. Keep an eye on it, freeze it, but chances are you will be fine. Other questions? No? He's dying to get out of here. I can see it on your faces. Okay, in that case, if you have any questions that you think of, later on you can email me at T is in Thomas, S is in Sam, Y is in yellow three at cornell.edu. And thank you very much.